The primary source study tour introduced us to arts in Beijing, desert sunrises in Dunhuang, marketplaces in Xi'an, natural beauty in Hangzhou, and progress in Shanghai. We networked with local teachers, interacted with local students, and sampled local cuisine. It was a chance for reflection, exploration, and connection. And what I experienced changed the way I thought about China. The Dandelion School in Beijing is special because it provides an education for middle school students of migrant workers, a population left otherwise uneducated in the cities or left behind in rural areas by their parents. Founded in 2005, the school is called Dandelion because these flowers are common but everywhere, and with a little breeze, the seeds scatter across the land. The school motto is, Step Strong But Softly, and it hangs framed in the library. The Temple of Heaven was built by the Emperor Yongle to make sacrifices for a good harvest. Standing by the temples was like stepping back 500 years in time. Along the entrance, elderly people played card games, took naps, and plucked instruments. The afternoon had turned damp yet humid, and exploring the grounds in the drizzle gave it an intimate historic feel, even filled with tourists like me. Emperors, who once resided in the Forbidden City, often spent their whole lives within the complex. When I looked around, it was easy to imagine it just as bustling as in the days of the Ming and Qing dynasties. The only difference would have been the lack of umbrellas. A stark contrast was the modern art district in Beijing, which was fresh and unique, filled with little galleries and boutiques. The Beijing Opera incorporates song, dance, and resounding drums to bring life to Chinese folk tales. Built by the blood, sweat, and tears of millions of men who were buried along with the bricks, it is historic, iconic, and undeniably majestic. Neither pictures nor videos, and not even National Geographic could do it justice, and clearly enough communicate the sheer wonder that swells within you as you stand upon it and look around. Poets and storytellers have attempted to capture its essence, but until you've felt raindrops turn to snowflakes on your face, felt your thighs scream in agony as you reach the top, or seen clouds flow like ocean waves over the mountains, you have not experienced the Great Wall of China. From east to west, we visited temples all over China. We saw pilgrims flock to light incense and give offerings to Buddha and Bodhisattvas. The temples felt like a link between the human worlds and the spiritual and natural worlds, and they were peaceful places of meditation and prayer. Bouncing atop a camel led by a sun-wrinkled man, it was breathtaking to turn my back on civilization and venture into the sand dunes, like travelers on the Silk Road did hundreds of years ago. I thought of the ardor travelers used to endure, carrying water, food, and supplies, with only the natural resources of sand, sun, stars, and wind as friends and guides. Lucky travelers happened upon oases like Crescent Moon Lake, a natural deposit of rainfall off the dunes. Like a desert mirage, we attended a dramatic Chinese performance of circus arts inspired by the Mogao grottoes that enchanted us with dance acrobatics. excavation site of the terracotta warriors and in this humongous pit they found 6,000 terracotta warriors and their horses. The warriors each have different facial features and traditional dress that indicates their military rank but during a peasant revolt they were unable to protect the emperor's tomb and had their own weapons used against them and their maker. The Women's History Museum in Xi'an is about her story. 
It is very different from the stories about kings and courtiers, gifted scholars and beautiful ladies, heroes and outstanding figures. All of the women shown here are common women, and we cannot seek and ask for the names of some of them, but they lived and existed. They are significant because they poured all their hearts, loves, goodness, and wisdom into their lives, and if you look closely, you can see a series of their hidden history. The vast amount of generations, ethnic groups, and dynasties represented in the museums we visited did not cease to amaze me. I looked at things 1,000 years old and wondered what life was like for the people who made them and used them and what happened to the people who had them. The job of historian and archaeologist seems daunting. How do we really know that piece of metal or pottery or wood was used for the purpose we imagined? Ancient languages also confound me. How do we know what those characters once meant to the people who wrote them and read them? It all seems like a puzzle too complex to figure out. It also made me think about the impact and legacy we will leave. The people who used these items in the museum had no idea their bowls or art or herbal remedies would ever be on display. What are we doing now that will guide and entrance future spectators? I guess only time will tell. Our travels brought us to a small community of brick builders outside of Xi'an. It resembled other poverty-stricken areas I visited with dirt roads, stray dogs, and haphazard homes. It would have felt unwelcoming if every face we met had not erupted into a smile. And for lunch, a local family welcomed us into their home. We visited the local school and got to meet the students and the principal. As Confucius says, how happy we are as uh, friends coming from afar. And we even did a mini English lesson. Our first introduction to Shanghai and our last glimpse of China was from 100 stories in the air at the top of the Shanghai World Trade Center, the second tallest building in the world. It was the quintessential view of China. History meets the future. In Shanghai, there were modern skyscrapers on one side of the river and century-old gardens on the other. There is a Chinese proverb that says, Reading ten thousands of books is not as useful as traveling ten thousand miles. My travels to China gave me a new perspective on one of the oldest civilizations in the world.